What follows is an assessment of this claim by the preterist quoted above. We shall set forth the predictions of Jesus throughout the Olivet Discourse essentially in the order of the Matthean text, as found in the preterist David Padfield. Since our specific focus will be on the matter of false Christ and the abomination of desolation at the end, and I should just warn you ahead of time, by the time I got to the end and realized I was 21 pages single-spaced, I thought, well, maybe I'll deal with them a little more in depth some other time. But I do deal with it, but I thought I could write a bunch more pages here, and I better not. But uh, we shall reserve these to the end of the paper. As mentioned earlier, I'm relying on two preterists for this, last, this list of signs, David Chilton and David Padfield. The former being of limited value since Chilton primarily quotes large sections of Josephus' account of the siege and destruction but provides little helpful commentary on how these tragic circumstances are parallels with the words of Jesus. While Chilton provides considerable Josephine text but little else, I should rely then on the other as the representative preterist for the study. Many others could be picked up. I could have picked up uh, um, uh, Tommy's uh, real close friend, uh, Gentry, or some others, but we'll use the one I have. Not one stone shall be left on another. After leaving the Temple Mount on their way to the Mount of Olives, the disciples of Jesus were admiring the magnificence of the temple buildings, which would have stood in array upon traveling through the Kidron Valley and climbing the mount. Jesus used this question as an opportunity to teach regarding the destruction of Jerusalem. I think that's true. Quote, And he said to them, Do you not see all these things, looking at these buildings? Uh, Truly I say to you that not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. And I take that specifically not about the retaining walls, but about the, what the disciples talked. Look at all these wonderful buildings. He didn't say, look at all these wonderful retaining walls. And so he's referring specifically to that which is on the top of the structure, not that which surrounded. Uh, I've had people say, well, look at there. You had some stones left that weren't turned over. I said, yes, but those aren't the buildings. Find me part of the buildings up there. Okay. When one travels to the city of Jerusalem today, he will discover not a single one of the temple buildings remains that were admired by the disciples of Jesus. The only obvious evidence of the destruction of the temple are the stones that lie at the western wall that were pushed off the temple mount, retaining wall, by the angry Romans and fell to their present position. Now, those of you who know much about this know that they had to clear out a lot of those stones. They only left some examples behind. There was far more there in the initial excavation. This prophecy of Jesus was literally fulfilled. Papho quotes the alleged words of Titus that he did not desire the destruction of the temple. Few would disagree that these words of Jesus stated in reference to the disciples' comments and therefore his discussion of the sign of his coming and the end of the age fall to the, uh, refer to the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. Uh, that is, there's a big debate, and I don't want to get into that debate, whether Titus had intended or not intended to destroy the temple. And, uh, but the point of it is, it's not there, and that fulfills Jesus' words. Now, wars and rumors of wars. Beginning in verse 6, we observe a list of statements by Jesus that precede either the destruction of the Jerusalem specifically or the end of the age. Four of these that correspond to the four horsemen of the apocalypse, it appears to me, uh, in Revelation 6, war, famine, pestilence, and death. The remainder of Revelation 6 reflects the other aspects of Matthew 24, martyrdom, earthquakes, darken of the sun, red color of the moon, stars falling from the sky, terror of the earth from the coming of the Son of Man in judgment. All these things are found there. Interestingly, though, each of these first four preceded the time of Jesus and has followed even in more massive proportions since the fall of Jerusalem. That is, when you look at these things that are supposedly a clear indication of the fall of Jerusalem being, in fact, the, the fulfillment of Matthew 24, I do see those things there. And I also see them before Jesus was born. I also find them after the fall of Jerusalem. So what does all that mean? Are they really of that valuable predictive value? How then may they have this predictive value? The first of these relatively normal events begins with wars and rumors of wars. Quote, you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened. For those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. 
Panfil himself acknowledges that wars and rumors of wars was commonplace in the ancient world, as is also true today, but then draws a false conclusion. Quote, it is hard to, ma to picture a time more trying than just prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, end quote. He then comments from Tacitus and Josephus to demonstrate a comparison with the words of Christ. Now see how close these are here. Tacitus, a Roman historian, he says, said of this period, the history on which I am entering is that of a period rich in disasters, terrible with battles, torn by civil struggles, horrible even in peace. Four emperors fell by the sword. There were three civil wars, more foreign wars, and often both at the same time, quoting from the histories of Tacitus. Josephus tells of a day in which the, quote, people of Caesarea had slain the Jews that were among them on the very same day and hour, uh, which one would think must have come to pass by the direction of providence, in so much as that in one hour's time about 20,000 Jews were killed and all Caesarea was emptied of its Jewish inhabitants, end quote. Now, in contrast to this description of the wars of the Roman Empire and in Judea, the conflicts within the Roman Empire were not really wars between kingdoms and nations. That's the first thing I want you to notice. That's the prediction of Jesus. It was between kingdoms and nations. In the first century A.D., that is, if this is referring to this, as described in the Olivet Discourse. However, rather than the local war in Judea, the account of Matthew depicts something on a much broader scale, it appears to me. In the words of Craig Evans, quote, the expect expectation of global warfare and chaos, however, there were no major wars prior to the Jewish revolt. So if that's referring to it, uh, it's, it, it doesn't seem to fit. Moreover, as Mayer has commented, quote, as for the Parthian Wars and the risings that took place some ten years later, after in Gaul and Spain, they had no connection whatever to do with Jerusalem or Judea, end quote. That is, if we're going to rely upon these statements of Jesus, as you'll see in a little bit, that these are what are referring immediately to the fall of Jerusalem, that is the fulfillment of Matthew 24, and part of it is, 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 is all relating it to kings and nations coming against each other. You don't have kingdoms and nations coming against each other, first of all, in Judea prior to this time. You can't do that. And you don't have it in the Roman world at this time. So what's he referring to if that is referring directly before this period of time? It's just a question in my mind. What Padfield does not say is that prior to the war in Judea, the Pax Romana, the Romana, the peace of Rome, controlled the ancient Mediterranean world in most instances. Sadler says, quote, if this verse is a sequence of the previous one, then it can hardly refer to the time before the destruction of Jerusalem. For then the Roman power kept the peace of the world. It is consequently explained by many commentators as fulfilled in various local tumults between the Jews who were scattered everywhere and the various Gentile nations amongst whom they dwelt. But this by no means answers to such expressions as nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom they're, they seem rather to refer to such a time as the present when the civilized world is divided into many separate nationalities. Uh, you don't have that framework in the Roman Empire at that time. That's why you could move everywhere you wanted with no need to worry about boundaries. Now, thus the modern world with national boundaries and independent sovereign states better fits with modern, uh, modern times than with that of the Roman Empire uh, at the time of the Jewish Revolt. Another problem with connecting the predictions of wars with those referring to the Roman war against the Jews is that Jesus says that they are the beginning of birth pangs. Not the finality, you know, not the finale, not the end of the age. Even the death toll in the Bar Kokhba revolt was nearly 600,000, though the Talmud sometimes gives the, the amount even in the millions. I suspect that as bad as the destruction of Jerusalem may have been, there have been numerous events in human history, say the trenches of World War I, the Jewish Holocaust, the Khmer Rouge, which were more devastating than even the descriptions that Josephus provided in the, in the tragedy of Jerusalem. That is to say that this event in Jerusalem is equivalent to the, like what you find in the Revelation or the end of the world, from my perspective. As bad as it is, it's not bad as it can be. And it will even get worse in my perspective. 